mention handicaps in pool, and people gravitate toward their go-to position. They're bad because people have no incentive to improve, or they're not rewarded for their hard work. Any system to do it can and will be manipulated. Increased participation, and that's good for all of us, and people are competing against a level that's more suited to them like they do on the Peloton. I invite you, at least temporarily, to set aside that go-to position and consider some analysis. If you end up where you started, so be it. Many of you who are not interested in the analysis part should just pay no attention here. Look at a tournament. If it sounds like fun, enter it. If it doesn't sound like fun, don't enter it. Before we start, though, we want to stress that Fargo ratings are about rating pool players, not about handicapping pool. Us using fair match situations to explain what the ratings mean and how they work is not the same as us advocating people play that way. With that said, it's not uncommon for people to want to set up situations that are close to even or where the better player has a small advantage. To have a cogent discussion about handicaps in pool tournaments, we need first to recognize that the opponent plays two distinct roles in pool, and we also need to analyze rewards, payouts, the way an economist would in terms of expected value. Each person in the weight room has their own go-to weight, maybe something they can lift eight times but not ten. And sometimes they use a lower weight and do, say, multiple sets of ten, and sometimes they put on a higher weight and try to do a few reps. But they'd be no more likely to futz with each other's weights to train than they would be to put on others' eyeglasses to see more clearly. Here's how pool is different. Resistance that people experience for training and simulated competition is the opponent. So in pool, the other people play the role of opponent and the role of the weight of the barbell. When you start thinking about it like this, you see that weekly handicap tournament in pool as being like Saturday in the weight room when everybody spots one another while they're trying to max out at a new high weight. This doesn't mean you don't also occasionally have true competitions. It also doesn't mean this Saturday thing can't be a little mix of both. You can't make sense of any of this without looking at pool tournaments the way an economist would. And that starts with understanding the concept of expected value. With that, you'll see it's possible to mix the two roles of the opponent we just talked about, as a competitor and as your resistance. So imagine you step at Lucy's $10 coin flip stand every day on your drive home from work. That's five days a week, 50 weeks a year. So over the course of a year, you've done 250 flips. You've paid in 250 times $10 or 2,500. You lost your money half the days and got nothing, but the other half the days, you got $20 back. So at the end of the year, you've got something pretty close to $2,500 back. So in the bigger picture, Lucy's coin flip stand is neither a source of income for you, nor is it a cost. It's about a wash. What economists do is apply this view even just to an individual coin flip. So instead of saying for an individual flip, as most people would, you either lose and get zero or win and get 20 bucks, the economist says, no, 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 you're putting 10 bucks in, getting 10 bucks back. And we can put $10 in quotes if you like. But the idea is that half the time, probability of 0.5, you get zero. The other half, probability of 0.5, you get 20. You multiply those together and add them up, and you get $10. This is important to do because human decisions are based upon this expected value. You make decisions based upon this expected value, whether you know how to do the calculation or not. Another way to know the expected return is $10 here, is after you paid Lucy for a flip, you tried to sell your action, you would not be able to sell it for $11, but you would be able to sell it for $9, because its value really is $10. And we say the expected value of this coin flip transaction, taking into account the cost of $10 and the expected return of $10, is zero. If Lucy got frisky and increased her flip stakes to $50 or $100, the expected value of the transaction would still be zero. This is a feature of zero expected value situations. Everybody's willing to raise the stakes. Here's a few situations with expected value of zero. The cost for a player in a Calcutta is sort of crowdsourced to match the expected return. And ignoring green fees and added money, any tournament with either competitors that are similarly skilled or that's handicapped so that the matches are pretty even is a zero expected value situation. This is why we're seeing so many high entry XXX and under tournaments. People sometimes refer to the outcome as being determined by a coin flip with the suggestion that it's not a real competitive situation. And they have that backwards. Your favorite epic battle scene was a zero expected value situation, and that's the fight where the outcome is most determined by grit. We're almost ready to talk about pool tournament. Sometimes there's a component with expected value zero and another component with expected value that's not zero. Here's two examples. You tip Lucy $2 every time you win. In that case, the cost is $10 and the expected return is $9, so the expected value of the transaction is minus a dollar. Or Lucy charges a VIG, an extra dollar on each flip. Now your cost is $11 for each flip, and your expected return is $10, so your expected value is minus a dollar, even without a tip. This notion of the two different components is important when we talk about pool tournaments. So imagine this weekly tournament. Let's make it simple. No green fee or added money, single elimination winner take off, and all seven entrants are rated the same. Everybody has a one in seven chance of winning, so their expected payout is one seventh of $35, which is $5, so the expected value is zero. One week somebody says, 
hey guys, why don't you just double everything, make it a $10 tournament, $70 to win, or even quadruple everything, make it a $20 tournament, $140 to win. And as long as everybody can handle the swings, they're going to be okay with it. Expected value is still zero. Instead, Justin Bergen starts showing up. It's now eight players, $40 to win, and Justin always wins. And they're probably okay with this. They get to be around Justin, learn from him, occasionally win a game from him, or all is good. Until somebody says, hey guys, want to double everything, make it a $10 tournament? And that's when you find out in an unmemorable weekly tournament, people are willing to donate a skinny vanilla latte, but not a monster thick burger combo. Players may on average be willing to be a $5 dog in a weekly tournament, but that number goes up when the status of the tournament goes up. So for a monthly or a regional or a national tournament, uh, it's a bigger deal and people are more willing to pay more just to be part of it. Those of us who create tournament experiences need to be aware of these values because what we need to do is create win-win situations where there are best tournament experiences for most people and there's money in Justin Bergman's pocket. What's the correct way to improve this tournament, to make it more exciting and maybe bigger? The common solution is an obscene one, and that's to kick out Justin Bergman and then double everything. It's obscene because we're taking an activity we supposedly care about and we're saying if you get good at it, you're not even allowed to join in the fun and be part of the journey. We know how to fix this problem. This red bar is the entry fee for a pure contest tournament, the one where Justin gets all the money and everyone else is donating. That entry fee can get bigger and bigger, $3, $4, $5, but at some point it's going to stop. It's not going to get any bigger. The green bar is the entry fee for the tournament where we're all in the weight room challenging each other against our own personal resistance. It's the one where everybody has zero expectation, and as a result, they care less what the entry fee is because it's coming back to them on average. What if we said, these don't have to be separate tournaments? We're smart enough to design tournaments that have the characteristics we want. We can design tournaments for which a portion of the money is distributed by skill, according to who put in the effort, who put in the time, and who's better. And we can make sure that amount is commensurate with what people are actually willing to pay for it. And then another portion is determined by who stays down on the shot better, who's bringing the personal A game, who's got the determination and the grit today. This is why we play in most tournaments, to put ourselves in a contest situation, to challenge ourselves put ourselves in a situation where we'll only succeed if we dig down and summon our best. With the hot column here and the eight-player tournament with Justin in it, about one every $13 of the entry fee goes from the weaker players to Justin. So in that eight-player tournament with a $13 entry fee, Justin is expected to get paid out 20 bucks, and the others are each expected to get paid out 12 bucks. If they doubled the entry fee to $26, Justin's expected payout would be $40, and the others expected payout would be $24. They could go up to an entry fee of up to $65 in this tournament without exceeding their vanilla skinny latte limit. With the medium column, about one in every $5 of entry fee goes from the weaker players to Justin. So any entry fee up to $25 here would be no worse for them than the original eight player $5 tournament. Using the mild column, one out of $3 goes to Justin. So think about this. Rather than having a low entry fee $5 tournament where Justin basically always wins and the payout is 40 bucks to win, you have a $15 entry tournament where the payout is $120, and you actually sometimes win, about one every 12 weeks, as a matter of fact. Now, I used example numbers just to be able to explain it, but the idea is that using any of these columns, we can construct tournaments for which Justin has a higher expected value than does a 650, and the 650 has a higher expected value than the 550, and the 550, and then the 450. But we can control the degree to which that's true, so you don't end up in this nobody's willing to show up if the entry fee is more than a few bucks, issue. People have incentive to improve because their expected value is higher, the better they play. And no matter what skill you play, you have some reasonable probability that you're going to win the tournament or you're going to beat Justin occasionally. I'm just using Justin as an example of a high-level player, so I really mean all high-level players when I say Justin. It's important that Justin understands this issue. He and others should not lament being excluded from the $500 entry, 650 and under tournament, because this tournament only exists because the 640 and 630 level players see a zero expected value situation and are just playing out their own personal epic battle fantasies. The other thing is the top players will lose a lot to weaker players. Lose tournaments, lose matches, they'll scratch on the opening break and get the set run out by a 550 player who goes to two. But when they win, they'll be winning a bigger tournament with more money that wouldn't have existed without the format. In fact, it's a similar message to industry sponsors as it is to top players. You, you can't just keep raising the price of fancy chalk with no limit. And to players, you can't expect people to pay more and more to watch you or to compete against you. So the real message is the only real way to get more money into pool is to have more people caring about it and more people participating. 
if Justin's effectively going to get a few dollars from every participant in a weekly tournament, it's better if he gets that from 20 players rather than 8 players. So what about handicaps in pool? Good, bad, complicated? They're certainly complicated, or this would be a two-minute video. But we also think, like a lot of things, they're good in moderation. Good if used correctly. In fact, if used and designed strategically, they get more people playing and more people striving to get better.